Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of the Aftermath series. Let us waste no time at all and dive right into this week's episode of Critical Role. Now this was such, just such a nice, easy episode, easily digestible, not a whole lot to unpack, not terribly eventful. However, that fight in the beginning, which we will talk about in a moment, uh, was a bit sketchy. But let me just first say that I just absolutely love the live shows, as I'm sure many of you do. It's just awesome seeing so many critters being so hyped about the show. I love hearing all of the crowd reactions to the various things the cast does. It's just such an absolute joy to watch. And last year, when the cast did their live show at Gen Con, Lorenzo was killed by the Mighty Nine, the one who killed Molly Mock. My my, how things have changed since then. But now, okay, with all of that being said, let's get into it. As I said before, not a whole lot to unpack, but there were a few things that I would like to talk about. The first being, this was Ford's first fight that happened in the beginning of the episode without his powers, and he did incredibly, as not put it. He used that whip to restrain this giant worm creature, and he stood his ground despite his lack of powers. Is he trying to prove himself? Trying to prove his worth still? I do think Ford wanted to show that he could still bring skills to the table in a fight, but he does need to be careful. He isn't powerful anymore in the sense of magical capabilities. He shouldn't push himself too hard as he was taking damage, straining against the strength of this giant worm. I'd hate for something to happen to him just because he wants to prove something. But even after the fight was over, Ford was the first one to run into the belly of this beast after Clay, taking damage from that as well. This whole fight really just showed the courage that Ford has, and how just because he doesn't have his magical abilities anymore doesn't mean he can't put up a good fight. And metaphorically speaking, he's almost stronger than he was before because he's learned how to deal with not having his magical powers. But I'm sure even though Ford did well on his own, he would certainly want to have his powers back regardless of what happened. But now, at the end of the fight, the killing blow done by Jester, the imagery of her guiding bolt was just absolutely phenomenal. The symbol of the Traveler appearing, the doorways opening, and then the guiding bolt launching from her hands. Just that whole mental picture was beautiful. But oh man, the crowd reactions to Bo and Clay almost dying was incredible. It definitely added to the hype and intensity of the situation. Which, as I said before, is one of my favorite aspects of these live shows. They're just such high energy. I just, I just love it so much. Hopefully, I can attend one in the near future. And now moving on after the fight, Nott and Bo had a friendly race up a tree. Now, obviously nothing too crazy happened in that. Not may, not may have shot Bo in the ass with her pistol, but they're fine. They're still friends, right? Yeah, they'll still be friends. They both just had their competitive side show through. But now the party has entered Uthadurn, the city where they were hoping to find Dolgrum Smeltborn, the creator of the broken sword they are carrying with them. And I know I've said it before, but Matt is just so good at world building, so good at coming up with new cities that feel fresh and new and lively. Uthadurn is absolutely incredible. The architecture, the different levels, the discs, it's just all so cool and it always feels so new. I honestly can't express enough how amazed I am at Matt's ability to create such unique things. And while the party settled in at one of the taverns, a rather touching moment happened where Nott took the initiative to walk up to a group of strangers, more or less introduce herself and ask about the town. She didn't seem worried that they would be afraid that she was a goblin or react to her differently. She just rolled up with confidence and did really well for herself, which I was extremely proud of, as Caduceus Clay was as well. Just a nice, subtle character progression note. Will not do this in the future? I don't know, maybe she just felt comfortable because it was a new town, it was far north, they probably don't see many goblins, so she probably felt safe and at least comfortable to do such a thing. And now let's move over to Caleb briefly as he expressed his concern for the scourger that remains in Rosanna. He desperately wants the Kryn Dynasty to hold off 
on executing this assassin so that Caleb may talk to her further. I'm not sure what information he's looking for. I can only assume it's in regards to Astrid, potentially, but maybe he just wants to learn more about Trent or what their plans are. I'm still worried that this Scourger will eventually escape and warn Trent that Caleb is still alive. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but I have a creeping suspicion that it will. And another subtle moment that I just wish to talk about briefly is how adorable it is that Jester is always looking for a bakery. I don't know, I just thought that was super adorable that she wanted to find one and just burst in with excitement and, and bought as many cupcakes as she could and shared them with the rest of the group with such joy and enthusiasm. And now we move on to the party finding the smelt-born smithy and unfortunately learned that Dulgrim has passed, but his son is more than capable of repairing this sword. However, they need the breath of a white dragon. Now, the party is powerful, however, I don't think they're powerful enough to take on such a beast. Now, I will say that they did take care of a blue dragon before, however, in this area, I'm pretty sure the only dragons that may be around are adult or even ancient. So the party is going to have a relatively difficult time acquiring the dragon's breath. And before we wrap up this episode, y'all, I am already shipping Beauregard and Dylan. I think they would make an absolutely adorable couple. I am 100% for it. And honestly, with Dylan being a mute and Bo being, well, Bo, they would have an interesting dynamic. You know, Bo has a loud mouth, she's abrasive, she says what's on her mind and all of that, she's very aggressive. It would be interesting to see how she deals with a partner that is a mute, or even just a friend for that matter. So I, for one, am actually interested to see how their friendship progresses. I was joking a little bit about shipping them, but I do want to see something come from it some kind of a friendship or relationship, just because I want to see Beauregard interact with someone such as Dylan. But now, with the Mighty Nine having an objective, they are going to do what research they can to find out where this dragon might be, and if there's any easier alternatives to acquiring this dragon's breath. And, with all of that being said, we are going to wrap up. Let me know all of your thoughts, feelings, and emotions during this episode. How do you feel about the live shows? Do you love the hype that the critters bring, or do you prefer the more quiet nature of the regular episodes? I hope you all have an absolutely wonderful rest of your weekend, and I will see you all next week.